Also, a warm welcome from my side. I'm Raphael, and I will announce the speakers. <laughs> so, this is uh, Marco Eilers, and he's a postdoctoral researcher at ETH. Yes, and he's working on formal verification. So, um, who uses uh, MyPy, so the static typing for Python? No, oh, quite a lot. Okay, so if you like static typing, I guess you will also like formal verification because it's kind of, for me, it's kind of like the next level of. Uh, Type systems. The stage is yours. Thanks a lot. Yeah, sorry about that. Uh, right, so I'll be talking about formal verification um, and how you can use formal verification for Python code using a tool called Nagini. Um, so I'll start, well, actually, most of this has been said. Uh, so I'm a postdoc at ETH. I finished my PhD there last year and I've been working on automated formal verification. Uh, partly for Python, also uh, in general for security properties. But before that, I have worked in industry uh, for a bit. So in particular, I was at IBM for a bit and I did some uh, Eclipse development. Um, so before I basically got to Python uh, during the PhD and before that had some experience with like Java application servers and stuff like that. And I can't tell you how nice it is to get to write Python code coming from there. Um, but yeah. Uh, so Python is, is great, I think we all agree. Um, but yeah, there's, there's, there's some drawbacks, of course, and one of them is static safety. Um, so here's an example. I have a function that usually works that takes some s and then randomly, uh, yeah, based on a random number, either uh, appends s to a string or tries to divide 5 by s. Right now, if I call this with a string, then of course, usually in this case, it'll work fine, uh, but sometimes I'll get a type error, right? Uh, in Java, this wouldn't happen, but in uh, Python, I can have this situation where I find out at runtime that uh, I'm trying to run code that would not, would not have compiled in other languages. But yeah, so there is a solution now. Uh, we have these type ins. I can just say as is supposed to be a string. Um, and then if I run MyPy on this code, uh, then it will tell me what are you doing? You're trying to divide an in by a string. That's not a thing. Um, and basically, what I'll talk about in this, uh, well, in the re remainder of this talk is, well, why stop there and not go about 12 steps further? So why stop at preventing type errors uh, when we could prevent all runtime errors and ensure that our programs compute exactly what they're supposed to and maybe also uh, prevent them from leaking our passwords and stuff like that? So sorry for some memes from about 2008 or something, but our goal is now to prove all the things. And really, you can, talk, you can think of Nagini as uh, trying to be MyPy, but way, way more general. So if you run Nagini on a program, and I'll show you that in a second, um, then it'll try to prove by default that there can be no runtime errors ever for any arguments in any execution, uh, for any thread interleaving, whatever, um, that there will not be any uncaught exceptions. And if you've written any assertions or any specifications in the program, and I'll show you that too, then it'll try to prove that those always hold. Um, so, for example, let's take the function from before, and now s is supposed to be an integer, and, uh, well, randomly we either return 5 plus s, or we return 5 divided by s. And now I can call this with 0, and now MyPy, of course, will say this is completely fine because it's a type-correct program, but, of course, if I try to execute this, I get a zero-division error. So, um, this... I hope this is readable, otherwise I'll zoom in more. Okay. Um, so this is the same program as before. And uh, if I now run Nagini on this, then it'll take two seconds and then it'll say, hey, there's a problem here. And the error message isn't particularly great, but it says the precondition of five over S might not hold. And the precondition of a division, even though it doesn't tell us that here, is that the thing you're dividing by can't be zero. Um, so now to make Nagini happy, basically, and to prevent this uh, runtime error, I have two options, essentially. I could change my code, uh, or I could say, well, that's, the function is actually fine, you're just not supposed to call it with zero. Um, and I can say that as follows. I can now add a precondition to my function, and uh, I do that like this. So I import this contracts library here that comes with Nagini, uh, that defines or declares a function called requires that we can use to write preconditions. So this function, when you execute it, just does nothing. It's just for the verifier to read and interpret as a precondition. Um, so now I'll say here, you're only supposed to call this thing with values for s that are not zero. Um, and now what will happen is, if I run Nagini again, is it'll 
re-verify this function here under the assumption that s is not zero and re-verify re everything else too. And now it basically says, okay, this function is fine, but now my, cl my client here is invalid, right? Because it calls it with an arbitrary integer and that might be zero. So if I want to now make my pi, uh, sorry, make Nagini happy here, I don't know, I just change it to six and then in the verifier should say everything's fine. Yeah, so that's the basic idea. Um, and here it was a division by zero error that, that we're preventing, uh, but you can imagine that it's other things. So here's an example. Uh, I define a class just to have one, um, and I have uh, a function here, test cast, that gets an object and a boolean. And now if the boolean is true, tries to add two to the object and otherwise calls bar on it, so that seems, seems suspicious. Uh, if I verify that or try to, um, then we'll actually get a type error here. And this is actually a MyPy type error. So the first thing Nagini does is always run MyPy on the input first. Um, so MyPy says, again, what are you doing? Or adding objects to, to integers, you can't do that. But now something I can do to convince MyPy that this is okay is add a cast. Right? Uh, so like in Java, I can say, uh, cast this object here to an int and cast, uh, oops, this object to type cell. And for MyPy, this means, trust me, I know what I'm doing, right? So MyPy will now let this through because I'm telling it, just believe me that O is an int here and that O is a cell there. Um, but of course, that, so there's no runtime check. So, you know, I haven't changed the program, this could still go wrong. Uh, so now if I run Nagini on this, then Nagini will say, uh, again, the same as before, the precondition of function cast might not hold. And again, this is not the greatest error method, but the precondition of a cast is that O actually has type int in this case. So how can we uh, convince Nagini that this is the case? Again, we could write a precondition that says, for example, uh, well, if uh, B is true, that implies uh, O is an instance of int. And if B is not true, not B is instance cell. And now I try to re-verify, and now hopefully it's happy, yeah. And so you can see here, I'm writing these specifications, and they're, I mean, a lot more verbose. You can immediately see that, and then just writing like int or bool after a parameter, right? But also I can say stuff that's a lot more expressive, like, okay, this uh, value is allowed to have these, um, this, this variable is about, is allowed to have these values, but not that one, or it can be something conditional. I'm really quite free in what I can express here. So, but we're still just preventing errors here, so that's a bit boring. So let's try to do something more interesting. Uh, so here's a function that adds up all the integers until n. And I've already written a precondition, so let's only call this with positive things. And now what I would like to prove is that this actually computes what it's supposed to compute. Right? Um, and so now I can write a post condition in a similar way. For this, there we have this ensures keyword. Uh, that designates a post condition. Now I want to say the result of this function, there's a function for that too, so result is equal to, well, how can I express the sum of all integers until n? Well, there's a formula for that. Um, so I'll say it's n times n minus 1 um, over 2. See if it can prove that, and it won't. Um, so this, this actually holds, but unfortunately we have a loop here. The moment you have a loop, things get complicated. So now essentially, this is one of many situations where we essentially have to help the tool prove uh, the property that we want to see. Uh, so in this case, I would have to do this by writing a loop invariant. Uh, and that's similar to writing a pre or post condition. So I write now a property that is, uh, that is supposed to hold at the beginning and end of every loop iteration. And hopefully this property will help it prove that in the end this post condition holds. Um, and in this case, I, my invariant can be some can be similar to this essentially. Uh, so da, 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 da. sum is equal to i times i minus one over two. And I think I need an additional one 
maybe I don't need it, I'm not sure, uh, but let's say i is greater or equal 0 and i is less or equal n. And I think these together should be enough to convince it. Yeah. So now we know our function is supposed to, is, uh, it actually does what it's supposed to. And we can prove other things like that. So for example, um, we could prove that this function actually terminates. It has a loop, right? So it might not actually do that. Um, and there's a specification for that as well. It's a bit weird. Uh, other tools have something that's nicer, but there's a reason for this. So in this case, I just say in a precondition, it must terminate. The one is there, uh, don't worry about it. <laughs> um, and again, if I tried to prove this, it would say, I'm, I'm not so sure, convince me, please. Um, and what I have to do is basically tell it, okay, give it an upper bound on the number of loop iterations this loop is supposed is, is about to do. Um, and that I think n minus i always works as an upper bound on the number of, number of iterations we have left. So I have to give it an expression here that decreases with every iteration, but never becomes negative. And if I can find something like that, then the uh, loop is guaranteed to terminate. Now we have a version here that we know terminates and computes the right result uh, according to this formula. Okay, so this is a while loop. Um, I'm not sure if I've ever written a while loop in Python. Um, so just, uh, we, we can also do this with like a four and a range. Um, it's just a bit easier to write the specific, to write and explain the specification with a while loop, because here we basically need to refer to all the elements we've previously iterated over and it's a bit more complicated. Okay, but this is in principle how it works. So you add these annotations either to convince the solver that there can't be any runtime errors or to establish sufficient conditions to prove that there aren't, there aren't any runtime errors. And then maybe you write additional uh, assertions or specifications in there that you would like to prove about your code. So, go back to slides. Um, so I'll briefly talk about the architecture and then I'll show you a, a somewhat larger example. Um, so if you run Nagini on a Python file with specifications, then I've already said the first thing we do is just run MyPy on it. Um, if there are any type errors, we just reject the program. Also, if there are any untyped parts. So if you have an any type flying around somewhere, then, then that's too difficult, we don't do that. Um, and the second part is we do our own pass about the, uh, over the program. So it turns out that Python ASTs kind of due to the nature of the, or like syntax trees due to the nature of the language contain very little information. Um, so we collect some stuff and then we also check that you're not using any language features that we don't support on that you haven't written, I don't know, a precondition in the middle of a loop or something insane. Um, and if this all works out, then what Nagini does to actually verify the program is to encode it into a different, much simpler language called Viper, which is made for verification. Um, so Viper is, is also being developed at, at ETH in my group. Um, it's a simple imperative language and it has like specification constructs built in uh, and it has two different backend verifiers that are able to then like automatically prove uh, properties about these programs. And ultimately this all works by uh, using an SMT solver, in our case, one called Z3. So that's what we use to check if like everything we know, for example, at a given point in the program implies whatever we want to prove there. So Viper takes the Viper program and turns it into a bunch of logical formulas to check essentially. And SMT solvers are great and can just automatically decide those. In many cases, there are some, some limitations. Um, and I'll show you briefly what that looks like and also a somewhat bigger example. This, that's great. Oh no. PyCharm, cool. Um, I guess it didn't like that I resized the screen or something. There are PyCharm somewhere. Oh my God, <laughs> not even, okay. Uh, let's use a different editor or something.
that's great. Where did I put this? So here's, can I zoom in? Here's an example of a, like a more interesting program with specifications just to give you an idea of what that actually, nope, actually looks like. Control shift, twist keyboard. Nope, control plus. Well, I need the shift for the plus, right? <laughs> okay, sorry. Um, so quick sort. Um, it's it's a simple implementation. Uh, I took it from like some uh, uh, online online portal, um, but th this gives you like an, an impression, I, I would say, of what it takes to actually prove something interesting uh, about a program. So Quicksort is a simple sorting algorithm, right? Um, and basically, the interesting condition, the interesting uh, properties that I'm proving here are like these three lines. So this one probably can't read it. Uh, says, I have, an, I have an input list of integers, of course, and I return an output list. And this condition says, okay, if I take the uh, list of integers that I return and then take a multiset view of that, so the multiset of all the elements in the list, then that is the same multiset as it was initially for the input list that I got. So really what this means is I didn't like randomly add or throw away any elements from the list. The elements in there are the same. I just have to express this somehow in a specification, right? Um, and then this one is probably the more interesting one that says, well, for all integers i and j that are in bounds of the list, if i is less than j, then the result list at i is less or equal to the result list at j. In other words, the list is actually sorted. Okay? So these, these two lines are kind of the ones that I care about. Uh, there are some preconditions that I have to write. Uh, and then this is what like the loop invariant looks like. So it gets complicated. Um, not only do, do I need this, this loop invariant, but then in the end I had to write some additional assertions where it's like the prover couldn't quite get it and I basically had to say, okay, maybe try proving this and then try proving this and then in the end it got to, to where I wanted. Um, right, so I actually wanted to show you what that looks like in the Viper encoding, but I can't do it now because PyCharm. Um, but basically, it's, it's this, and then in a much simpler language, and then everything's desugared and looks ugly. So we have a, a really big program at the end of the day in a, in a really simple language, and that gets verified and turned into logic formulas to, to be checked by the SMT solvers. Um, right. The other thing I wanted to show you, but now actually just can't, uh, is you can get counterexamples. So this is really useful. Um, so when you... Uh, Nope. I can at least show you the example, maybe. Yeah. Maybe you can read this, I don't know. So foo gets two integers, uh, i1 and i2. And so it's, it's just a super simple program to, to demonstrate something, of course. Uh, and we say, well, if i1 is equal to i2, then we assert that i1 is i2, so reference equality. So this doesn't actually hold in Python, of course. And if I try to prove this, then uh, Nagini will say, well, actually, I can't prove that this assert uh, holds. And here's a counterexample. So here is a set of inputs where this doesn't hold. And then it, for example, shows me uh, I1 being 0 and I2 being false. So those are equal, but are not the same object. Right? And this kind of stuff can be really useful to see kind of what's going on and why I can't prove what I think I should be able to prove. Okay. So that worked out great. <laughs> uh, so then, some caveats. So I said uh, Nagini is basically trying to be MyPy, but much more general. Uh, but Nagini is an academic prototype, right? Uh, it will crash sometimes. Uh, it, repeats, it supports a lot of features of, of Python, actually. So it's not like a tiny subset, and then it has Python syntax, and then we call it Python. Uh, but we support subclassing, overrides, exception, try, except, finally, uh, iterators, concurrency. You can have threads and locks, uh, property and class method, method decorators, generics, union types, a bunch of like MyPy features in general. So there's quite a lot of stuff supported. 
but there's also a lot of stuff that we just didn't do or didn't do yet. So lambdas, nested anything, nested classes, nested functions, uh, those are not necessarily difficult to do, we just haven't done it yet. Uh, and there are many small things like that. There are also some things uh, that are intentionally unsupported. So, for example, overriding math magic methods like get attribute and stuff like that. Because that can just... I mean, that's nice about Python, right? And uh, it's a wonderfully dynamic language and you can do a lot of stuff. But it's also incredibly difficult to reason about. And meta classes and eval, for example, are other things like that. Um, so... That's just currently not supported, and if you try to verify code that does this, Nagini will say, sorry, I can't do that. Uh, but I've actually have, I have a master student that started this week that is going to work on trying to um, reduce some of these limitations. We'll see how well that goes. Um, there are other things that we just currently don't really have. Uh, so, of course, if you have uh, real code, it's usually going to use a bunch of libraries. And for the verifier to be able to prove that your code is correct, it's going to need to know what those libraries do, or at least you know how you have to use them. Um, so we need more stuff for like standard libraries. Uh, we have some stuff built in basically for stuff that's used all the time, like lists and sets and dicts uh, and stuff like that. But there's a lot missing. Um, performance can be an issue. Uh, these the the quicksort thing that I was trying to show you. Uh, takes like 14 seconds to verify. You could see like there are a lot of quantifiers, right? I said a lot of stuff that I try to prove for all integers in the range, and this tends to get like complicated. These are like incredibly useful specifications, and you need them to prove a lot of interesting properties, but they're just uh, difficult. And yeah, documentation, because I didn't feel like writing it. <laughs> um, so more caveats. Uh, specification is complex and requires a lot of work. Uh, so probably if you want to, and you have like some really neat algorithm that you wrote, and you want to make sure that that's correct, this is probably something that you could try doing. You usually can't verify your entire application. So in fact, we have uh, a project at ETH in our group um, that's trying to verify an entire application, and that's like taking years of work by like experts. Uh, and also you should expect that the specifications, I guess you've already seen that, are usually longer than the code itself. Uh, that's, you know, some people say that's a feature, not a bug, but this is how it is. Um, and you'll need to know what you're doing, of course. So I showed you basically specifications that I think kind of, uh, well, definitely the ones that I showed you in like a larger font and even in the uh, quicksort thing, those are mostly things that make sense on the Python level, right? You've seen that our uh, language for specifications is just normal Python expressions. But the more interesting stuff you do, the more kind of specialized verification specification you need. Um, yeah. And then there are some theoretical limits. So the SMT server that we use to automatically check properties just can't decide things that are undecidable. So for example, if you have too many multiplications of unknown integers flying around, it'll just, well, in the best case, it'll say, I don't know. In the worst case, it doesn't terminate, uh, just because it's impossible to solve this problem in general. Um, right, I think that gets me to the end. Uh, so in the future, I've already mentioned we want to add more uh, support for dynamic code features. We want to reduce the overhead for annotations a bit, um, in particular by just um, reducing the need for annotations on the level of this intermediate language uh, that I couldn't show you. And then, yeah, I've already mentioned library support would be really nice. I think it would be really cool to try to verify something machine learning related. Unfortunately, I know nothing about machine learning. <laughs> um, so I don't know. If somebody wants to talk, that'd be cool. Uh, one problem that I can see there is, as I said, at the moment you have too many multiplications flying around, uh, things tend to get tricky. So maybe it's an issue. Um, but yeah, so you can find it on, on GitHub. It's open source and it's there and you can try it out if you want. And I think that's it from my side. All right. Uh, thanks a lot. I think we have time for questions. So um, there should be helper with microphones around. Just go to the, just raise your hands and keep it up. Then the helpers will find you. I see one in front there. A few there. 
Thanks for the talk. Um, you had an example at the beginning where you had uh, some function required that a variable is different from zero, mm -hmm. and you called it with a specific value. Uh, I'm curious to understand what Nagini does in like running code when you cannot know what value is going to be passed in. Right. Um, so basically, it always tries to prove that everything is correct for all possible input values. So if I call it, if it says uh, the value must not be zero, and I call it with a completely unknown value that could be anything, then it'll report an error. Um, so basically, when it says, yes, everything's fine, then that should always mean, unless there's a bug somewhere, that should always mean a bug in the verifier. Uh, that should always mean that uh, the, all the properties you specified actually hold for all possible inputs, even the ones we know nothing about. Out of uh, left field, sorry, but maybe you will, you will know. The Viper language that you are using, is it the same Viper language that MicroPython uses for optimization, where they have a Viper decorator? I, I don't know the other one, but it's definitely not. <laughs> I see. Okay. That's, that's... So that, that, that the, the underlying Viper thing here is, is uh, specifically for verification, and basically there are, uh, like, it's supposed to be an intermediate language that you use to build front-ends for other languages. So, for example, we have Nagini that encodes Python into this Viper thing. We have uh, front-ends for, for Rust and for Go and for some smart contract language that do essentially, well, this, the same thing, just for different languages and specifically made for that and not useful for anything else. You can't even execute Viper programs. They're just meant to be verified. Thank you. Great presentation. Um, I got a question here. Over there? Uh, here. Um, can you turn it off on production code? So you showed the quick sort algorithm and you had these many um, uh, implications or assertions, let's call it assertions. And um, that's very, that's perfect for testing and developing. But when you have it in production, you probably want to turn it off because of performance issues. So do you have a single switch where you can turn all the Nagini, it's called, right? Can turn yeah. all Nagini off. Um. So basically what we have, although I haven't used it in a long time, is uh, everything that's verification related will always be like a call to this, like requires or ensures or invariant or some of these functions, right? So basically you can just remove them automatically. We have uh, some pass uh, that takes the program and just removes only these things and then you basically get as output a program that's identical and you can just run that but doesn't contain these things anymore. You mentioned the word SMT solver or something mm -hmm. like that a couple of times. Can you explain what that is or me, uh, at least what the approbation means? Uh, it, uh, satisfiability modular theories. So uh, you may or may not know what uh, SAT solving is. So SAT is kind of this, this famous NP complete problem, right? I don't know, you have a bunch of Boolean variables and you have some constraints about them and you want to find out if it's satisfiable or something like that. And SMT solvers are basically do similar things. You, so you declare a bunch of variables and functions, and then you, uh, you generate constraints about them. So for example, you say I have x and y, and x is greater than y, and y is less than 15 or something. Um, and the solver can, is able to tell you basically if it's possible to satisfy all, this, all these constraints at once. Um, and if yes, it can tell you, hey, this is an assignment that works. And if not, it says, no, this is unsatisfiable. And you can essentially, if you have if you want to prove things, if you want to prove that uh, everything you know about the current program stays implied, implies whatever you want to prove, you can encode that into checks of this kind. But it's essentially a thing that takes like logical formulas about integers and other things also uh, and says in the end, yes, this is satisfiable or no, this is unsatisfiable. You said that it's quite difficult to prove like a whole application. And that made me wonder if you have a recommendation or use cases where it's good to use something like Nagini together with all the other testing tools like fuzzing and unit tests and so on. If you could say something about that. Yeah. Um, I think this is basically, so what you would usually do if you want to verify something about a part of a bigger application is you pick essentially a part 
that is like that does interesting stuff because like a lot of stuff will be code that doesn't really do you know the crucial stuff or isn't complicated or something um and you'll essentially write a specification for the parts that it's interacting with and just don't verify that so you're saying okay i'm, I'm going to assume this specification for the rest of my program and now verify this part here under the assumption that the rest, rest behaves like that and then it makes a lot of sense to uh, test these specifications for the rest of the program. So if these specifications are just, you know, uh, 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 Python expressions, you could automatically check them, right? We don't have that for Nagini specifications in Python. Um, we kind of have it for some of our other front ends. I think for Go, we have something like that. But this is basically a, a combination that I think makes a lot of sense. All right. Are there, yeah, no questions? Uh, yeah, I uh, just wanted to ask, uh, so you said you had other frontends that already work for Rust and Go, so mm -hmm. static type languages. Uh, so can you quantify how much harder is this in Python? Because I really wonder, <laughs> it sounds madness. Uh, yeah, <laughs> it's, um, so the subset of Python that we currently support is not that much harder because we have the type annotations and because we forbid using some things, right? So it's still definitely, we're far away from Java. We're still supporting the subset that's like more flexible than that, but it doesn't make verification a huge, like that, that much more difficult. We have to model some things in the encoding. It makes that, you know, maybe it makes things a bit slower, but it's not a huge issue compared to Go, for example. Compared to Rust, Rust is incredibly much easier um, because the type system gives you a huge amount of guarantees already. And that's like all of that is stuff that you would have to specify and or verify separately for like, well, Python or Java or Go. Um, and in, in Rust, if you are willing to trust the type checker, then you just don't have to. Cool, thanks. Okay, there's another question over there in the front. I'm interested what happens to this Nagini contracts in the runtime. So there was already a question about production, So, but I'm not sure that I understood the question. Are they actually executed or are they ignored? So, uh, right, I forgot. What. Um, um, so if you run the Python program that contains the specification, then those like requ the requires calls, ensures calls, those are just function calls. So those calls will be executed, right? And the arguments will be evaluated, but those functions do nothing. So essentially, if you write requires blah, 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 right? Um, then it'll evaluate the blah, 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 and then call uh, the requires function, which immediately returns and basically ignores its input. Um, and so th th there's some overhead, and it's, but it's basically not doing anything useful. It's just evaluating the arguments, yeah. All right, there okay. don't seem to be any more questions, but I would have another question. Huh? So mm -hmm. could parts of this be implemented in the type system of MyPy? For, exa uh, uh, for example, the non-zero integers, mm -hmm. I guess they could be implemented in MyPy, and would this help Nagini then? Yes, definitely. Um, so th th there are, like I think, various things that you can do that would be kind of halfway between MyPy and, and, and this. Um, and like... I mean, a simple thing is like the MyPy already has like optional types, right? Where where the type itself tells me whether this can be none or not. And I think similarly, you could have like more expressive types. You could have like a natural type or something that says, okay, this integer isn't isn't negative or something like that. And there's a thing that goes a bit further. That's like also like um, that's called like refinement types, uh, where essentially you say, okay, this is an integer and it also has these properties, but you still handle all of these things in the type system. People have done that for Haskell. Um, and you're a bit limited in the expressiveness, but also you usually have better performance and, uh, than, than what you get like this. So there's, there's, there's levels, there uh, are levels yeah. everywhere, I think, in between. Okay. Oh, oh there's another question popped up. I uh, think this will be then the last question. We have a coffee break right after the next talk, so we will have time to bombard him with questions. Uh, yeah. Who is it? Uh, there. So um, related to this last question, I mean, in, in the typing um, module of the standard library, you already have this annotation. So maybe you already could do something like that. 
And um, my other question is, are you thinking of also um, providing something like a non-invasive um, version of, of Nagini where you don't have to import, but maybe put all your requirements uh, into comments or something like that? So we're not planning that. If, if I did the whole thing again, I would do that. I am, I am somewhat regretting uh, that we put these in as function calls. It's, it, was, it was kind of the easy option, right? Because that meant that we could, just, everything's just part of the code. We don't have to pass them separately. MyPy type checks them uh, and, and it was just easier. Um, I think it would be better to put them in comments or something like that and our other verifiers do that. Uh, and I think it wouldn't even be that hard to do, but we currently don't have plans to do it. Just because at the end of the day, for us, this is mostly an academic project, right? And you don't get to write papers about, hey, we changed our spec language. Uh, and that's like obviously always kind of a, a consideration. And then there was the first part. Sorry, I forgot. I just wanted to mention that there is all, already uh, okay. a feature yeah. in the typing uh, module. Right. Um, yeah, to be honest, uh, I, I should look at that. I, uh, like the last time I looked at what MyPy and the typing module now does, it surprised me with a lot of stuff that I uh, didn't know about yet. So I should definitely have another look. 